<laughs> quite a bit of it. And they're very motivated with the tubes, right? With the visual, the visuals, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that's crazy. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. We're going to get right into, into the meat of the matter of this show. I mean, I've got two individuals who've been here before. Uh, both I've known for a number of years. Uh, one in particular, I've got to make it a point about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's uh, speech in Washington, D.C., and right up front with you, the thing that comes to mind right off the bat is the, the situation we had here in the city of Portland about the custodians, Portland Public Schools. And, yep. and I want you to know that Jim Lewinberger, who's here with us today, was the guy who, who was the legal side of this and carried this thing really to the point where many custodians were able to save their jobs. It was unfortunate at that point in time, and, and it was a very tough situation because you had a union, a union, if you will, an SEIU union, mm -hmm. that was basically bringing in other union inf inf folks to take the jobs, if you will, of, of SEI paying dues members at Portland Public Schools. And, and again, I want to thank you, Jim, for, for being there with those guys. And it's been tough, and it, it really hit hard on, as you know, one of the principal persons up there, our dear friend, and, as far as I'm concerned, he still is a friend, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is you were there all along, and, and, and you were there all the way, because the Oregonian was against us, and I mean, we had, we had all sorts of folks around, but, but a number of those guys were able to save their jobs and were able to retire. So yes. thank you for that note. You bet. Okay, fine. So anyway, Jim is here with us today, and we've got Herb Gray, uh, who's a member of the You Choose piece. He's always a good, good candidate, if you will, to, to gather uh, uh, some background for, for issues, or regardless of what issues that I've, I've, I've come up with especially civil rights issues and things of that nature. Both are attorneys, by the way. And uh, so I said, well, look, you know, what I'd like, what we'd like to do on the, today on this particular show is that we've heard a great deal about the heard, whole issue of the shooting back in Florida, about the Zimmerman situation and Trevon Martin. It was unfortunate that, as far as I'm concerned, both of these young people were, 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 were had, had some major impact on their lives. And, and especially during the timing that we're in at this point in time, we're we're sort of like in a sort of an unbalanced situation we're, we're in regards to leadership, and we got the black and white situation, we got civil rights, and we got a lot of issues. But I think we're going to go through this. We, we're going to get through this situation. I think we did with the first, first the, well, the first um, African American president of these United States, and we knew there was going to be some issues trying to get through this point. But the fact of the matter is, we're having the discussions. I don't think we can afford to be divided. We've got to be, we got to be Americans across the board. And so, um, so anyway, but the bottom line is that uh, we're going we're gonna to go through this thing. So what we're going to do today is that uh, they still talk about the whole issue of the, the shootings back in Florida. Uh, they really haven't gotten to a point where we can say, okay, fine, uh, we know exactly what happened. We, this, this, this is what we're going to have to live with on an ongoing basis. So the, so the, 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 the situation is still out there. And, and they haven't actually closed the case, I'd put it that way, right. at this point in time. So what we thought we'd do in this, this particular show is that um, we thought we'd have a discussion about uh, 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 what was the definition, if you will, of hold your ground and, and talk about the history, how that all came about, if you will, uh, what role did Oregon play in this particular case, how many states actually adopted those laws, if you will, uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and, and how, what's the inter again? Like I said, what's the interpretation of that? And we'll just sort of bring it up to date, and then leave it open, if you will, for the future. From the standpoint of, uh, we can, we can, I'm sure that you guys are going to mention the fact that Eric Holder, our Attorney General, Federal Attorney General, is going to be basically, uh, possibly looking at the possibility of bringing this thing to court and whatever. So that's still playing out. I'm not sitting at the table. We're not sitting at that table. There's a whole bunch of discussions over there at this point in time. But at that point in time, when it, when it does come to the table, then we're going to bring it back to Oregon and sort of at least share with Oregonians in terms of what impact will this have on their lives day in and day out, okay? So with that, let's just open it right on up. Sure. Well, what I was going to say, Bruce, is that a, a lot of people don't know that the whole concept of self-defense and stand your ground as part of that is something that goes back centuries. I mean, there's lots of law on that subject. When Jim and I were both in law school, 
we spent uh, the first part of our first year of law school studying uh, various kinds of, of uh, what we call torts mm -hmm. and defenses, and self-defense was a big part of that. Yes. And part of what we talked about um, when we were going through uh, learning, learning the law as first-year law students is talking about when can people defend themselves and the re what, are the, what are the reasons for what, how they defend themselves and what's the limitation, if any, on how they can defend themselves. And there were a lot of things that we learned historically that go back hundreds of years. For example, if you're attacked in your own home, you have a lot more latitude on what you do. If you're attacked out in public, you probably have some latitude, but maybe not as much as if you were in your own home. It depends a little bit whether or not you're being, a person's being attacked or whether you're trying to defend property. Mm -hmm. So the rules are different if somebody is coming after you or a loved one, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody's trying to steal your car. That affects the, what you can do in terms of, of dealing with that situation. And what the law has always recognized is you can't generally use more force than what's being applied against you. So historically, everybody had the right to defend themselves okay. um, from any kind of an attacker, whatever, whatever was going on. And so if we think about that, it shouldn't be remarkable that people, in the United States at least, that people have the right to take certain measures to defend themselves and their loved ones and even their property. Um, and yet, in today's context, everybody tends to look at it from the standpoint of a lot of other dynamics that, that may color their judgments, and of course we're all looking at these kinds of, dis of cases with the benefit of hindsight, and we're sitting there being the Monday morning quarterbacks and evaluating how did people act and did they do the right thing. When people confronted with a, with a stressful situation, you know, at the time, mm -hmm. probably make different decisions than they, they might make and that we all might make if we're sitting around and thinking about it later. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important for people to understand that the law really tries to um, encourage to one form or another people's right to defend themselves. Okay, okay. Well, let's go back in time, let's say, in history. Let's, we were talking a bit about that part about, uh, about defending and, i.e., uh, initiating, uh, i.e., the, the, the issue or whatever, Jim. Right. Well, it, the, the Bible is a great source for law. Uh, and there was a right way and a wrong way to conduct war. Israel was, was enjoined to never initiate a war, but if they were attacked, they could, they could respond and, and use overwhelming, I mean, and, and destroy the enemy. But uh, that is, um, uh, has been incorporated not only on a national, national level, but also on a personal level. Uh, you can, if you are attacked, you can use whatever force is necessary to, to defend yourself. And the, and the key thing, and that, but that has evolved over time. And now in the United States, uh, it's a it's a question of uh, what did how did you think? Now, for instance, if you think you're at risk of being killed, you can use deadly force. If you think you're only going to be slightly hurt, you can't use deadly force to to uh, like so just slaps you. You can't use deadly force to to uh, repel that. Uh, but if you fear that you're, you're, you're at risk of dying, you can use a, a gun, for instance, to defend yourself. Now, that, there's a lot that gets calculated into that. Who, who's doing the attacking and who's being attacked? So a very frail person, for instance, uh, a 90-year-old woman who is bedridden, uh, the mere fact that uh, some aggressor you know, walks into her uh, bedroom that would be more than enough uh, for, for her to rationally just shoot him immediately, mm -hmm. uh, because she, she, <laughs> that, that's. I mean, she doesn't. It's not have a much, fair fight. It's not a fair fight, right? Uh, but if, on the other hand, if, if it was a 250-pound linebacker who was in his bedroom and and the lights were on and he saw that it was a 90-year-old woman, you know, opening the door to his bedroom, uh, he probably couldn't use a, a firearm to to uh, shoot her, mm -hmm. uh, stand your ground or not. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to you have to use you have to use reason and 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 you and if you survive the encounter, chances are you're going to be first you'll be looked at by police officers and prosecutors and then ultimately a jury, and you have to justify your actions, um, mm -hmm. which is another interesting thing about defense. Uh, we long ago said you can't set traps for people. Let's say that <laughs> that people were stealing your chickens. Uh, if you set out a trap 
like with the shotgun, so that if a person opens the, the, the uh, door mm -hmm. and a shotgun uh, is, is shot into that person, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. That would you'd be brought up for murder or uh, assault if the person doesn't die, mm -hmm. and, and you would lose. I mean, mm -hmm. so you have to use you, you can't do it remote. I mean, it, you have to be actually, a person has to be making the decision. It can't be on automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, we have we have burglar alarms, but we don't have you know uh, shotguns raids. So that if a person enters your home illegally, they get shot immediately. Uh, a person has to make that decision. Okay, okay. Well, let, let's get back again. Give, give this lay person that's sitting out there understand your ground because that's that's what that's what's out there right. right now. Okay, let's talk about stand your ground, if you will. How would we? How would one identify? I know we're going also, but how does, how would one uh, define stand your ground? Well, I think we have to start with uh, a little bit of history lesson Good first. Uh, basically, stand your ground is what it used to be. Uh, uh, if somebody if somebody is attacked, you can defend yourself. Right. Okay. Then uh, over time, courts said, uh, no, you can't just uh, defend yourself. You have to give the assailant. You you have to retreat. You 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 can't assume the assailant is going to do you harm. Mm -hmm. You have to retreat, and if the assailant continues, or assailant continues to pursue you, then at some point you can stop and, and, and defend yourself. Mm -hmm. But first, you got to move back, move back, move back, and uh, it, it has been construed I mean, ridiculously. I mean, people, you know, well, people have been harmed by by doing that, uh, going back and back, and then ultimately get killed anyway. Um, uh, so, in r response to judges creating that rule. Uh, legislatures uh, have said in certain some states, like Florida, mm -hmm. that uh, no, you don't have to back up. At least in your home, for instance, you don't have to back up. If a person comes into your home uninvited, you can shoot away right away. You don't mm -hmm. have to. You don't have to step back. You don't have to go into the bedroom. You don't have to go. You know, you don't have to do anything. Just shoot. But what about police? Let's say, for instance, if they suspect maybe a drug raid or something of that nature, what, what about them if they just should? <laughs> Well, I have to that one there. all right. Well, I, I, I that, that that puts you in a very difficult position if you're in your own home and somebody comes bursting into your home in the middle of the night, uh, you know, and you defend yourself. You'd better hope it was a criminal, because if it is police officers coming in and you kill one or, or two of them, uh, although your actions may be completely justified in the eyes of the law, chances are very very good you're not going to survive the encounter. Hmm. Uh, police officers don't. Uh, you know, don't enter a house in ones and twos. They usually have a, a whole big group. Mm -hmm. And if one of their own is, is uh, killed in the process, they tend to make sure that the people who killed one of their brothers uh, does not survive the encounter. Hmm. 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 Interesting. Hmm. Well, I was, I was just thinking that, you know, it shows how difficult a lot of times these judgments are. And I, I think the fundamental thing that, that everybody has talked about over the centuries, whatever the context, whatever the weapons, is who do you give the benefit of the doubt to? If there's a question about who was in the right and who was in the wrong, do you tend to favor the attacker or do you favor, tend to favor the victim, depending on who they are? And, and I think historically what the law has said is if somebody's particularly caught unawares, or if they happen to be frail, uh, if it happens to be a woman and uh, her children at home, and somebody's coming in, there's generally been a preference in the law for protecting the the decisions and the and the the life of the victim or the person being attacked. And as Jim described, you have a situation where sometimes people, again, sitting back in a black robe thinking about it afterwards, may say, well, I don't think that was a reasonable choice under the circumstances. It may have been dark. It may have been, you know, a woman alone who had been threatened by an ex-boyfriend or something, but I don't think she handled it appropriately. You know, however that goes, there are people second-guessing those kinds of decisions. And I think we get into a difficult situation if, as a society, we say, if somebody's going to attack another human being, let's assume that they have should have more rights to protect themselves than the person they're going after. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think, and that's really where the issue joins on this stand for ground, stand your ground thing, because in our in 21st century America, where most of us don't deal with guns on a regular basis and we haven't been in the situation, people tend to think that um, we have to be civilized about this. 
And I think it's there are a lot of people who do the Monday morning quarterback thing mm -hmm. and say, well, gosh, after sitting here in my comfortable chair, maybe having a glass of wine while I'm thinking about it, I don't think that that person handled the situation right. And I think, you know, so you end up in discussions about stand your ground from people who have never been in that situation and haven't really thought about the history of it or what the bigger picture is. They just tend to focus on those particular circumstances. There's one thing I need to correct you about, Herb. Uh, we have lots of guns in this country. We have far more guns in this country than people. Hmm. So uh, <clears throat> there are many, many of us who have guns and use them on a regular basis. Ag agreed. <laughs> Even in this room, I think there's some people that own guns and use them on a regular basis in a lawful way. Um, guns are ver a very important and, and prevalent part of our society. Uh, so, yes, are, but uh, one of the things is the people that wear the black robes oftentimes rely upon people wearing blue uniforms to protect them instead mm -hmm. of defending right. themselves. Mm -hmm. Most of us can't afford uh, to hire bodyguards and, and have to re rely upon ourselves to defend ourselves and our families. Well, I, and I don't disagree with what you just said, but there are a lot of people, especially the really vocal people, um, who think things like stand your ground is ridiculous, who either have no connection to firearms or don't think anybody else should have uh, any connection to firearms. And that tends to be a vocal group of people who maybe have never been in a situation or don't have that sort of life experience and think everybody else should be like them. Yes, but fortunately we live in Oregon. And although Oregon does have a, uh, you know, a lot of liberals here, uh, and you would often think that, uh, see, one of the things about guns, is it, they, gun ownership and gun rights cross all lines. Uh, sure. the, for one thing, <laughs> uh, a lot of people consider you know, gun owners to be conservative, but there are a lot of uh, homosexuals that have guns, and thank goodness they do. I mean, frankly, anybody who, who feels that, that they are a potential victim uh, should be able to protect him or herself with, with a firearm. Uh, and so you have people that are, are liberals that have firearms. You have people that uh, uh, are conservatives that have firearms. Firearms go cut, cut across all sorts of lines. Um, so well, this, And in Oregon, lots and lots of people have okay. firearms. Well, this, this, this idea of, of, uh, of a major concern among us today about protection, one's protection or whatever, is it more so today than, let's say, from a... From a, you know, say from the past, maybe the last five years or whatever, is it more, more? Depends on where you live in Oregon, frankly. Okay. Well, there are parts of the state now where uh, uh, police departments have uh, are laid off people. There's, they're, they're basically, there are parts of the state that really don't have a police pre officer presence. Right. right. Particularly in the uh, southern part of the state and some of the coastal areas. Um, and so those people, uh, because of budget cuts for law enforcement, essentially are in charge of their own uh, self-defense. So they're arming themselves. Whereas in other parts of the state, like Lake Oswego, where I live, there's practically more cops than people. It's, <laughs> uh, and, and there's, a, there's and a, to be clear, cops are people. Okay. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> and, and in Portland, there are lots and lots of police officers. Um, so one could have a, a sense of uh, I'm I'm being protected by the people we've hired. Um, and you know, if you're comfortable with that, okay. Uh, and I think that's that's nice to have that, I suppose. But I want to make sure that if somebody comes to my home, mm -hmm. uh, I won't have to rely upon the police to uh, protect my family. So what's the ratio of, of folks owning, the, say, the concealed weapons permit, let's say, in a metropolitan area, like a Portland area, as opposed to an out, outside rural area? What do you uh, think? I don't Something know. I don't know, that that? I don't know how that breaks down. I don't know how it breaks down. But um, I do know that in uh, when you get outside... <clears throat> There, there are a lot of really good reasons for having concealed handgun license, mm -hmm. particularly in a community like Portland that has a lot of laws against firearms ownership, local laws against firearms ownership that do not count for people who have concealed handgun licenses. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for instance, in, or in, in Portland, you cannot carry a firearm that is loaded in a public place unless you have a concealed handgun license. Uh, and that's gotten a lot of people in trouble if they uh, have a loaded firearm in the trunk of their car and their car is on a public street uh, and the police find out about it, they can be prosecuted and have been prosecuted for having a, a loaded weapon in a, in a public place. Hmm. Now, if that person had a concealed handgun license, that's fine. They're, they're good. And we're still talking, folks, about stand your ground. I mean, whether we, 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 this, but this in, discussion is... But in rural parts of the state... Uh, a lot of people carry firearms, to, you know, openly, mm -hmm. and it doesn't cause a ruckus or a fuss because 
Lots of people have firearms openly, openly mm -hmm. displayed. But uh, if a person were to openly carry in, in Portland, they're likely to cause a ruckus. Uh, people get upset. Uh, it shouldn't be, but, but they often get upset. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so I recommend people get concealed handgun licenses. You, you know, one point, and this is going back again in, in, in sort of historical standpoint, I, I think about the dueling aspect of it, kind of like a supervise, if you will, stand your ground kind of a deal where folks are just getting two firearms, standing back to back and walking tense faces and turn around and bang. Uh, was that, would that still be considered? Well, uh, the thing about dueling was, and I, it, uh, Herb and I have been talking about dueling here recently, uh, uh, dueling has a fascinating history in our, our country and in, in Europe. Uh, the, the purpose of dueling was to protect one's honor. Mm -hmm. If one was insulted, one could challenge the person who insulted uh, to a duel. And, and, and they would have, uh, uh, they'd face each other. It could be with swords, it could be with firearms, uh, and uh, honor would be restored or, or uh, uh, you know. Vindicated. Or vindicated, right. Um, uh, now, there's also been a long history. Let's put this way. There, there was a, a, a big battle against dueling, which predated Oregon. Oregon was created in 1859, and part of our original Constitution says that if you are involved in a duel, you cannot hold office. Hmm. Really? Yes. Gee. Man, <laughs> Joe, you had to do a little audit on Let me check that out. <laughs> Our president of legislature. Anyway, any, any thoughts about that, please? Well, I, I don't think I have anything to add to what, what Jim is talking about, but I think the, the idea that there were decisions made about um, what's an appropriate role for firearms in resolving disputes between people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. was a conversation and there was a recognized way in many circles that that would be okay. Well, now, in Oregon, we decided obviously differently, yeah, but... Yeah. Uh, well, what about but the, Oregon has, we also yeah, have Article yeah. 1, Section 27, which has been misconstrued by the Oregon Supreme Court. But it, it, it's, it's clear, its language says that the, right, the people have the right to keep and bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that the, the Supreme Court has gotten wrong is they've said that doesn't count for felons and that doesn't count for insane people, which is, it, which is a complete misreading of the Constitution, which had nothing to, it didn't say that, except for felons, and it didn't say except for insane people. Yeah. And uh, I, I think the court just, just plain got it wrong, and uh, they, they, just, uh, they just decided one of my cases this week. Uh, I represented a man named uh, Niall Stark, and uh, he had had a felony conviction. He had got it reduced to a misdemeanor by a court order, and then he got a firearm, thought he could, uh, and he was found to have the firearm, and he was prosecuted for being a felon in possession of a firearm. And he said, hey, wait a minute, I'm not a felon. Well, unfortunately for him, the statute defining, saying what a felon in possession is, it says that a person uh, is not a felon if at the time of the conviction, uh, or at the time of the judgment, I'm sorry, the person was a, at the time of the judgment was a, uh, not a felon, he's not a felon. Mm. Uh, and so what it boils down to, what the Supreme Court ultimately said was, since his was reduced to a misdemeanor by order, he was still a felon in, for purposes of felon in possession. Hmm. Uh, uh, <laughs> drives me nuts. Um, anyway, but, but, they, but they did better than the Court of Appeals because the Court of Appeals had said, once a felon, always a felon, at least the Supreme Court said that if his attorney had used a gotten a judgment instead of an order, he'd have been okay. Hmm. Oh, wow. But it, it's, uh, you know, it's an example of uh, putting form over substance. Uh, and <laughs> the court made a point of saying, well, basically, everybody knows a judgment is different from an order. You know, a court judgment is different from a court order. And I guarantee you, nobody who's not a lawyer would even think there's a difference. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court does, and, and that's what matters for Oregon law right now. Oh, present day stand your ground as far as the various states running around. I mean, is that the entire United States? I mean, all of them have basically laws along that line? Or? Well, I, I think it's safe to say that more than a majority of states have some form of stand your ground. Some are more expansive than others. Okay. Um, Where do most of and, and Oregon kind of is in the middle of the pack, I, is I guess. Right? Is so the we, best. Do, we do have laws. We, along that line. We, we basically follow along with that, that general idea. Um, 
I mean, I think that if, if you look at the states where it's been adopted, it tended to be um, historically southern and I'll say progressively western states, you know, as, as uh, we moved across the, the continent. Um, and the retreat sort of idea tends to be, I think, more limited to sort of the more densely populated areas. Now, there are exceptions to those rules, but in general, that's kind of how it, how it plays out. And, but I think it's important for people to recognize that stand your ground is, is still pretty much the majority. So if we want to, for those people who want to characterize it as some sort of an extreme thing, it's not. Um, and what's really interesting is some of the research I've seen suggests that when it was adopted in Florida, mm -hmm. it passed the Senate unanimously and by a huge majority in their House of Representatives. And it wasn't many, very many years ago. So even in Florida, not very many years ago, everybody thought this is an easy one. And they tended to take a more expansive view of, of, of the stand your ground kind of, kind of approach to things. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's probably, I, I'm not sure about the exact circumstances how, how Florida legislature saw do the right thing. But it kind of reminds, it leads me to think there must have been some news story <laughs> involving some poor person who, who uh, attempted to you know back up back up and then ultimately got hurt because mm -hmm. that's how you're going to get those huge majorities uh, right. in your Senate in your house uh, and, and I'm, I'm, it's sad to see so much law being news driven uh, mm -hmm. laws should be more uh, permanent uh, but we have so so many of our, our lawmakers are very emotion uh, and their constituents are very emotion oriented and the legislatures tend to uh, often follow why is it so? Because that's the nature of a democracy. Okay. That's okay. the nature of a democracy. More so today, though, because of the no, 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 no. Uh, Athens was famous for that. <laughs> Athens was fa Athens was famous for having these big swings of opinion, uh, and and you know people's lives were ruined in the process. That's a long way back, Jim. Well, it is. Athens, Greece. But everything. that's yes. But that's why our founding fathers were afraid of a democracy. Yep. They, mm -hmm. We didn't start off as a democracy. We started off as a republic. Now, we did have a democratic institution in the federal government, and that's the House of Representatives. But the way it was set up at first was the Senate was a very different creature. It wasn't, there was no, it wasn't popular vote for senators. It was the legislatures of the 50, or the, the states, who elected their two, each state had two senators. And the whole concept, for instance, that, that a tiny little state like Rhode Island has the same number of senators as a huge state as California mm -hmm. is a vestige of that Republic process of uh, a, a different non non democratic uh, rule. Um, uh, when um, oh, I can't remember his name, but one of the Supreme Court judges years ago, uh, many years ago, said that uh, uh, the way a particular state had apportioned its its voting districts was Ill unconstitutional because of the concept of one man one vote. That was saying essentially we need to be a democracy. We, be, we need to be more democratic. Uh, uh, but the Senate is an example of an institution that's completely undemocratic. Right. Mm -hmm. By design. But by design. Because we want it, but founding fathers were, were afraid of these big, strong emotional pushes one way or the other. And they wanted to have more stability. And the Senate is, uh, was designed to be a more stable uh, impediment to rapid law change. Uh, when we adopted, what is it, the 13th or 14th, whatever amendment was, it said, from that point on, which is in like 1913, 1914, senators would be, would be voted by the people of the states. Uh, that cha radically changed the way our government uh, operates. Well, and you were talking about um, the founding fathers. Right? I think it was James Madison said, you know, we're in big trouble when people figure out that they can get the government to give them stuff. That's when we start down the road to decline. And he said it much more artfully than I just did. but. It was a recognition that democracy is not the way to go, that a, that a Republican form of government is what avoids um, sort of a mercurial, um, you know, heat of the moment kind of decision making process. And that seems strange to mo many people today, but I think part of the problem is that most people don't have a sense of the Republican principles upon which our government is based. Right. They don't understand history. And they don't understand even a lot of the background that we're talking about, which is fine because you, you know, not everybody goes to law school and learns the nuances of this. What happened to our educational system? 
But the, 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 the problem is that people do not have the perspective of saying, let's just stop and take a deep breath and figure out what a good decision is mm -hmm. as opposed to what sounds like a good decision today okay. or what's going to play well in the media. Okay. And what are the big differences we're between... Take a short break. We're going to take a short break. Hold, hold your point there. Right. Okay, folks, as you can see, we've got, we got quite a discussion. We've got, we got another 30 minutes or so, and we're going to definitely get into the, the incident in Florida and get your perspectives of that. Sounds okay. good, okay? We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. <laughs> okay, folks, back again. Bruce Broussard here, Voters Digest, and I've got my two guests here. We, we're trying to make some sense, if you will, uh, to find, uh, to stand your ground. The incident in Florida really just got folks all involved. Uh, many were just basically doing a lot of talking at home and Media was driving this thing quite a bit, a great deal for that matter. And a lot of times if you don't have the background, you, you're just sitting there trying to figure out what to do. Well, hopefully you've gotten some feel of, uh, of what the law is all about, uh, how it came about, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this whole business of, um, uh, uh, of defense and defending yourself and defending others and this, that, and the other. So what we're going to do this 30 minutes or so is I'm going to take advantage of these guys. They're sitting here right in Oregon, and uh, I'm sure that they were watching this case too. And, and looking at this piece, and I'm sure they've got some some uh, their, their feelings. Are, well, you know, from a factual standpoint, and I know both of these guys enough to know that that's where they're going to be coming from. And um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do that this time around. However, you had a point to make right before we broke. Well, I was going to say one, to one of the things that distinguish republics from democracies is okay. that in a in a republic, you're supposed to have rule uh, of law rather than rule of men. Okay. Uh, that they're they're. E e e long-term, if not per perpetual, principles. Uh, whereas in a democracy, uh, men are, are swinging things back and forth. And we've always had a tension between the two, uh, rule of law versus rule of men. And you see it, for instance, when the composition of the Supreme, United States Supreme Court changes. Uh, when you get different people on the court, they start saying the law is different from what it was when the other people were on the court. Mm -hmm. And so there's always been a conscious, or there's always been a, a tension uh, but in a, in a, in a, in a pure democracy, uh, the law is less important than what the people want at any given moment. And that's one of the things the Founding Fathers were very worried about. They didn't want the big shifts of uh, right. public opinion affecting uh, law. Uh, and I'm afraid we've moved more and more towards that over time. Hmm. We've, moved away from a or we've moved away from being a republic to a democracy, and uh, that it, which is, I guess what another way of saying is, I don't think the Founding Fathers would have been happy with that. But as long as the people who live here today are satisfied with it, that's what we're going to have. We, and, and I guess it's 
one of the things that Benjamin Franklin commented on when uh, asked immediately after the uh, uh, Constitution was, was drafted. Uh, uh, she, he was asked, what, what have you done or what, what have you made? And he said, uh, uh, a republic, if you can keep it. Right. Hmm. So it does require constant vigilance. And uh, the people are responsible for what their elected officials do, what the government does, because the government is a reflection of what we let them get away with. So I hope... You're not too happy right now, though. Well, I hope things change. I hope the people stick, stand up and say, hey, wait okay. a minute. We need to change the way things are. That mm -hmm. it's it's not healthy. We're not going in the right direction. We need to go back to what I I liked the way we were. Uh, granted, there were huge problems. One of the, the, the fundamental problem that the founders couldn't resolve was slavery. Mm -hmm. the, the, they just it, I, there were there were many men who wanted to abolish slavery, but they just couldn't do it and and maintain the, the state the United States. Right. Because the, the slave states would not have, uh, and I shouldn't say slave states, the southern slave states clearly would not have allowed for it. States like Delaware was, was still a slave state <laughs> up through the up until the Civil War, uh, and they probably wouldn't have been okay with it. So there were certain there were slave states that weren't you know emotionally attached to slavery, mm -hmm. but there were other sta slave states that were, and and they, they couldn't agree to it. Mm -hmm. That's why we had uh, the War of, of Northern Aggression or yeah. the, the Civil War. Right, right. Uh, to, re to resolve yeah, that, and, and we're still living still with are. it. We're still it's, living it's with unfortunately. it. Unfortunately, yeah. Hopefully. Well, even when maybe we we shouldn't be living with it, we live with it because that tends to be people's frame of reference. Yes, mm -hmm. and I don't think it, that is that's our original sin. The United States' original sin was and is slavery. Mm -hmm. We have not gotten past it yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. I hope we do eventually. I had hoped, and I hope that. The election of uh, 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 African American uh, Barack Obama would would start uh, or would go, take us down the path of healing. Well, we're having a discussion. Unfortunately, I don't know. What do you think? I don't think so. I think things have gotten worse that's since a, he was elected. That's going to be another discussion we're going to have. I right. think we need to come to the table. Okay. Really, really, let's do that. Well, okay. but that's what the Trayvon Martin uh, exactly. Zimmerman yeah, case exactly is a reflection. Exactly. A, a, a this year reflection of that's why their emotions were so high yeah. on this. Mm -hmm. I think if you if you if you take the emotions out of the case, the jury got it right. And it was pretty straightforward. In fact. I don't think that Zimmerman should have been prosecuted based upon the facts that were laid out to the jury. It was a clear case of self-defense. Uh, and the only reason it was prosecuted was because there was a lot of pressure to, uh, uh, to be, being brought on, uh, on the state of Florida to make sure this guy gets prosecuted. Have there been similar incidents like that particular situation in other states that you might have known of? Any research that kind of like said, okay, fine. There, there were other areas, there were other states that had similar kinds of incidents. Black and white, white and white, black and black. I haven't done the research. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I think there, there is evidence to suggest that actually there's less incidence of white on black or black on white than black on black and white on white. But here's another thing we got to remember. Zimmerman was not white. Yeah, exactly. Zimmerman was Hispanic, a, a Peruvian descent, I guess half Peruvian, half white, based upon his parents. Uh, and and my understanding is the very first time the use of the, word, the, the phrase white Hispanic was because of this case. It, it had never been used before mm -hmm. this case. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a similar thing that was tortured in terms of English language was the constant referral to Trayvon uh, Martin as a boy. Right. Now, black men or black males, have, you, a white person cannot call a black male a boy, whether that, per, whether that male be you know, two years old or, or certainly older. Yeah. But that, that term is, is, was deemed long ago to be a, a horribly pejorative term. But in this case, a lot of people were calling him uh, a boy, even though he was 17 years old and, and a big, tall, uh, healthy, Man who, from a from a purely physical structure standpoint, was a man. And well, in private section, the N word was used quite a bit. I'm sure so. You know well, but but I think I mean even the portrayal of him. A lot of you know the pictures that are shown tend not to be him as a 17 year old. Right. Well, and, but that's, and, a, that's media driven. Though. You well, but you know, and that's it where depends I'm, upon which is it, which is CNN or Fox. It doesn't matter. You know, and that's, that's where that. I'm going with this. It's 
it's decisions being made somehow or another yeah. to portray things other than as they are. And I, I, I think we would all agree if, mm -hmm. if the facts were just presented to people and people looked at them in an objective way, exactly what Jim said would be true. Zimmerman would not have been prosecuted and there wouldn't have been the media frenzy over this. But there are other people who, for whatever reason, seem to, to uh, derive, want to derive some advantage from casting it as something other than what the facts well, are. Well, just like Jim said, I mean, you know, we are, we're having some trying times at this point in time. You know, really, the issue, I mean, we're finally talking to the issue of racism. A lot of some folks don't want to talk about who's the racist and who isn't the free racist aspect of it, but it's being discussed. And I think that's a good thing. And the fact of the matter is, is that... Uh, well, is oh, there yeah. really being a discussion of racism? Because what I'm seeing is people's <laughs> lives being ruined because they're mm -hmm. labeled a racist. Mm -hmm. yeah. This woman, this celebrity chef woman. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Paula Dean. Yeah, ruined because she said in the course of a deposition for a case that was then thrown out as being an invalid case mm -hmm. that she had used the N-word. Uh, and I'm afraid to use I won't use the word. I won't yeah. use that word. Yeah. It would, it would, yeah. I have political aspirations. I can't have a tape of me saying uh, that word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, it would ruin me. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway. But it's on the people, tape. I'm saying it, it's, that's, that's unfortunate. Like you said, you just can't see the case. You've got the, the issue of race is sitting up there, and then we're trying to figure out how to go through that discussion. Well, and again, I think what it reflects is not a focus on the facts, but a focus on what people think the facts are. and. Sometimes race can be injected into something when that's not really the point. And there are other times, and, and I'm saying it's difficult to have that conversation. I make no mistake about that. But how the Zimmerman case becomes a race thing when the fa everything about the facts shows that it was anything but that, I think is make, makes things really hard. And if people want to perceive certain things about it for whatever reason, and make it into something it's not. It's really hard. I agree with Jim that we don't really have discussions about race. We should. We, we, we should. sort of lob grenades doing, about we're race. It. We're doing it, but not as... Not as I, I'm it's not saying. a constructive, let's sort this out conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it tends to be an us versus them and, and dividing and casting aspersions on people as opposed to, let's figure this out. You know, it's a fascinating thing. That, I mean... We are a nation divided because I have been on your show here, and I'll never forget you had a guest who I think has been on here several times, and he's very, very upset that Portland has schools named after slave owners. Yeah. And that had never entered my mind until I heard him say that. Mm -hmm. But there is a, a, a real measure of truth in what he's saying. It is outrageous that people who have subjugated uh, others in a most reprehensible fashion, have schools named after them today. Mm -hmm. Still do. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not even on the white person's radar screen. We don't see... They didn't have to deal with it. Right. Yeah. So, and I don't know, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll never forget when I first felt, a, I felt that I was in a minority. I was a, a young man, I just got graduated from college, and I was living in Salt Lake City. And I was not a Mormon. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was I was in a minority, that I wasn't as good that that people looked down on me because I wasn't as good as they were. Uh, I didn't like it, and I, if that gives me a, a, at least a clue, no, oh, I should say that, another experience. Uh, I had a, 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 a handicapped awareness day exercise once. I spent a work day, not even a twenty-four hour day, an eight-hour work day in a wheelchair once. That changed my perspective on what it means to be able-bodied versus having living in a wheelchair. It changes your perspective. Because when you're in a wheelchair, you're looking up at people all the time. It changes the, the di interpersonal dynamic tremendously. It would be nice, I think, probably a good thing for every white person to uh, have, you know, color, you know, darker color, you know, for a day or two and see what life is like when you're not white in our society. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how else we can we can make us white people understand what what people who are not white live with every day. But but see that assumes also that we're in a that that we are willing to put ourselves in a position 
to understand another point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's a lost art in our society today mm -hmm. because everything is about labels now. So people sit over here and make judgments about those folks over there. And, and I think that's part of the problem. That's why we ha aren't having a constructive conversation about race or a whole bunch of things. Because you having that experience, Jim, of being in a wheelchair or being a non-Mormon in Salt Lake City, is some, most people do not, do not put themselves in that sort of a position. Well, you know, in all due respect, I like what, what you're saying, because I, I, you can see we need to have that discussion. And we're fortunate here at the Oregon Voters Digest. We've got a young lady by the name of Donna Maxey. She's a retired school teacher. In fact, she was on last week or whatever. And she, she was a founder of Race Talk. And she's doing a lot of these talks in, in various locations and whatever. But she's going to be an active person once a month. We're going to just talk about the whole issue of race. Racism, we're going to define it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And mm -hmm. we're just going to, and that's the whole idea. It's about inclusion. It's about understanding what it is and possibly getting back into the educational system. Because, you know, sometimes one thinks about the whole issue of the education system aspect of it. Do they even have a discussion, especially teachers and whatever, when well, they get their certificate? a teacher certificate, do they talk about the whole issue of race? Yeah. Well, I, I was just reflecting on your, your comment about the, the guest on the show talking about slave owners having schools named after them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, one of the most interesting things that ever happened to me as an adult was being in a room with somebody who knew something about Portland history mm -hmm. and started talking about people whose names are on street signs and school buildings and so on and who they were mm -hmm. and why they were famous and what they did. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating because mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that. It's not in our educational system, that's for sure. And, and, and I think that there is, there's a richness there if we understand stuff. We might make some different decisions. We may, we, we may not make different well, decisions, but I think it would be interesting if people knew about that, that particular yeah, yeah. situation, for example, and say, well, wait a minute, is that something we really want to perpetuate or not? Well, you know, in all due respect, there's, a, there's an issue now, right here within the state, in regards to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mascot the, the, the issue. The mascot aspect of it. And, and uh, again, we're going to have that discussion uh, with reference to, because a lot of folks don't understand what they're saying. You, know, you get the Native American, they're making a statement. And the majority are saying, well, gee whiz, wait, it's just sports. <laughs> I mean, what's the problem? You know, and well, I, if not that, I can find another Native American that will say it's okay. Or I can find another black that will say it's okay. They don't understand the circumstances as to why that person is sitting at the table right. giving it the okay. It's got to be for monetary reasons or whatever, just survivorship reasons. They're working for someone, and what do you say? No, I don't like it. Well, I think well, there's a problem, like too, it. because <laughs> increasingly in our society, government is making judgments about what's politically correct and what's not politically correct, and the government is enforcing certain standards, which is why... It's hard to have a mascot conversation because everybody who is intelligent and sensitive and compassionate and tolerant and all of those things can only have one view of that. Mm -hmm. So so a lot of people, I think, tend to get pre-digested sort of positions mm -hmm. that they think, well, I can't possibly think that through or make a slightly different judgment or look for some nuance in that mm -hmm. because I don't want to appear bigoted or whatever the case may be. And when the government is helping to drive that, in addition to well, you know, what other you, cultural you or point. social. I want to have a discussion about the definition of government. You know, it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. this, this science will be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Government is not something just abstract. These are individuals. Right. And I think we need to we need to understand that real well because we, we're so easy to say government did it. <laughs> yeah, individuals. I want to know who created the bill. <laughs> Yeah. What was the rationale behind the bill? That's the only way I think we can get back, if you will, to, to what, why, we, why we exist. We, we exist as far as, as far as I'm saying. It's supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, we I'll elect tell you. these folks, and what, what do they do, Jim? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if you want to know about government, <laughs> look at not, not even the laws. Just look at the Internal Revenue Code yeah. and yeah. see how it's grown and grown and grown and grown. We have... Simply put, we have far too many laws. The laws that we have, nobody understands. But why don't we identify the people who acted, who initiated to begin with? Who's the guy that wrote that first line, the basis, the first line, and said, "Okay, fine, this is what we need to do." We never asked that question. How does it come to the table? That's a very good question. You know, there is talk about having, uh, I think it's called an Article Five convention. Okay. Basically. 
uh, the U.S. Constitution has a pro there's, there's one provision for amending the Constitution, and there's another provision that says you can amend the Constitution by having a constitutional convention. Start from scratch, you know, uh, and there's something to be said for that. States have done it. Um, Oregon has had the same Constitution from its beginning, but other states have, have uh, basically uh, had constitutional conventions and scrapped the first Constitution and, and had a new one. Uh, I would, part of me would like to say, uh, Let's let's start from scratch on some of these things. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, a lot of people are attacking the whole idea of internal or, uh, income tax. I think income tax is a, is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, but for one thing, uh, before income tax, what we did is we we, we taxed imports, uh, and, and it doesn't take a lot of revenue agents to fit you know to do that. Uh, and certainly, the the federal government had absolutely no interest in knowing about what I do for a living, unless I was importing stuff. Then they want to get paid a piece of the cut on the import, but if I was just minding my own business within you know the states, uh, uh, they d knew nothing about me. But with the income tax, now they, they have a vested interest in knowing what I do for a living and how much I make and what I spend and all that. That's none of their damn business. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it goes back. Who initiated that process? There had to have been someone that said, okay, fine, this is what we're going to do to raise those. Well, but government of the people, by the people, and for the people doesn't exist. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of the things that I've said a whole bunch of times here recently is people have the government they deserve. Yep. Because okay. if people don't think about those things, if they think there needs to be more laws or there ought to be a law that says thus and so or prohibits people from doing certain things, you're going to end up with exactly what Jim was describing, where you have so many laws, nobody can keep it all straight, and all of us are probably in violation of the statutory law every day. Yes, but the, but but I'll make a point about Jim, and even I, I think I fall in that same rung. Jim is not the kind of he runs for office, but he's not the kind of guy that sits around and says, "Okay, fine, I'll just get in, and I'll just be a part of the group." Okay? Right. His position is that his his platform is very clear. This is what I'm going to do, but he can't get elected. Well, I mean, the standard about Fair? yet haven't come but, close. But, but I keep encouraging him get out there and right. do it again. But but see, there's a lot of discussion about the current Congress, for example. They don't. They don't do anything. Therefore, they're they're elect, doing a crummy job. But we elect them. Well, but well, how do how do they get elected? But here's the thing. <laughs> First of all, the assumption is you have to pass a bunch of laws to show that you're earning your salary, which I think is false, especially the way the founders conceived our our republican form of government. And secondly, if people are really that dissatisfied, why do they keep re reelecting all those people that have approval ratings in single digits? Well. That's a lazy electorate, wouldn't you say? No, that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that's a major discussion. <laughs> but I mean, again, that's what happens Not if we yet. lose the sense yeah. of a Republican form of government with fixed principles as opposed to the flavor of the day sort of mentality that seems to drive everything about us. And that's what's driving the issue we're talking about today. Well, you know, I, I'm putting it in very layman's terms. I think the way we, we operate today is that a person runs for office, the majority, and with, with a certain platform, do whatever it takes to get in the office aspect of it. Those are the folks that go to Congress, and then they're, and then they're, they're, they're basically greeted at the door and says, okay, fine, here you are. It's your first term. You stick around about two terms, or there's four terms, and that's right. You're a millionaire. You just join the group. Forget about what you learn over there. Just go on and just stay right here. And I think that's the attitude. I, I've not seen Congress today saying, okay, fine, let's look at our salaries on both sides of the aisles and say, why don't we cut back? Because we've got these issues over here. And well, you know, everybody's of course, together. The, the most wealthy senators are Democrats. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But I'm just saying, but it's the whole, it's the, everybody's there. It basically, but, the everybody gets a check. But if you look at the Oregon legislature, we still talk about having a citizen legislature. Don't we have that? And a lot of people are pretty regular folks. You know, they're millionaires in Congress, but there's not many millionaires hanging around right. the Oregon legislature, and there are not a lot of people who became millionaires hanging around the Oregon legislature. Right. So how do we change that? Well, I'm not. I'm saying I'm not sure that's a bad. Oregon may be closer to the mark. Well, we're than moving, Congress. but we're moving in the wrong direction. Now we have annual. Uh, they meet annually instead of right. every other year. That was a big mistake. And and. Uh, <laughs> we're, you know, whenever, whenever Congress, whenever the legislature is in session, whether it be a state legislature or the federal legislature, 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 our liberties are at risk because they aren't. They aren't giving us more liberties. They're always trying to take our liberties away. Mm -hmm. if, if Congress is in session, watch out. They're trying to take something from us. Mm -hmm. 
Well, look, we got about, uh, oh, I'd say about another four minutes or so. It's a good solid four minutes. I know we've been talking about the stand your ground aspect of it. I'm going to take the opportunity now to kind of get you guys. You really ran up at this point in time. There are a couple of major issues that are sitting up there now that the governor is looking at the possibility of reconvening the legislature. One on the PERS deal and the CRC, the Columbia River crossing. I mean, I mean, you saw the whole listing of folks at 170 million bucks that were spent, if you will, and then some of those same people were trying to regurgitate this whole piece again and whatever. What are your thoughts about that? How, how, did, how did you react when you when you saw, well, when you think about those two issues that are being re, 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 reconvening the uh, legislature? I, the what do you think about I, it? I have mixed feelings about it because I think the PERS discussion, there should have been a more thoughtful discussion of it previously, and it should have been acted on Oh, or in the it was and the US or the Oregon Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional what they did and they were wrong well <laughs> uh, okay fine but as far as the as far as the Columbia minutes. River crossing yes, real quick. that's a situation in my judgment where government won't take no for an answer whoever is pushing that darn thing I mean the idea well, that listen. Oregon would go alone well, they, on an interstate bridge. The Oregonian listed them all, the 170 million. They laid it all out. These are the people that are pushing this piece. Fair? But the people who have spent $170 million yeah. want to keep that going, and they're saying, why waste $170 million that we've already taken from everybody right. to do something that everybody's already said we're not going to do? <laughs> Jim, what do you think? i got well, a minute. I don't know anything about the Columbia River Crossing, okay. but let me tell you, go to PERS, because PERS is, it, PERS is going to kill us. It will. <clears throat> The, th the fact of the matter is we're probably bankrupt right now because of the unfunded obligations to the employees of Oregon. <clears throat> but there's one saving grace, and that is what Detroit just pulled their trigger on. It's called bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now the, the law is a little bit unclear as to who and what can declare bankruptcy when it comes to government. Clearly cities and counties can. There's an argument, well, the argument is states can't, mm -hmm. but de departments or divisions of states can. And if if that's right, then PERS should be declaring bankruptcy. Then wow. we can rewrite the whole thing. Well, then the other thing I'll say, and that'll be another discussion. In most cases, the people who are making the decision on PERS are on PERS themselves. Yeah, that's a huge <laughs> problem. Right. <laughs> well, on that particular note, folks, this It'll take good. us at least an hour to fix that. Oh, we'll have another discussion on that piece aspect of it. Okay, <laughs> fine. Maybe you can run for the Supreme Court again. Maybe you might be able to change some things. Get, get elected, okay? <laughs> well, folks, this has been really great, and I hopefully the viewing audience appreciated the fact that we've given you some insight from an Oregon perspective about the whole issue of stand your ground, and then we're able to get these little caveats right at the end of the program. Okay? Thank you guys very much. Thank appreciate you, Bruce. It. Thank okay, you, Bruce. Good. Thank you, folks, and hey, I'll see you next week, and we'll have another interesting subject to talk about. Okay? Have a good one.